One of the most fascinating and most investigated relics is the Shroud of Turin. And as technology continues to make advances, so do the scientists who use all it has to offer to unlock its secrets. In this Women of Grace series, Dr. Wayne Phillips will be our guest as he explores with us what many believe is the burial cloth of Jesus. Join us as we discuss the secrets of the Shroud. We Many believe the Shroud of Turin is the burial cloth of Jesus, and breakthrough technology is giving more and more evidence to their claim. Our guest this week is Dr. Wayne Phillips, an allergist whose medical specialty is the impetus that drives his dedicated interest in the science of the Shroud and the secrets it unveils. Today, he will share with us about the Shroud's history and its incredible journey. Also with us is Father Edmund Sylvia, no stranger to you, our theological advisor and Women of Grace chaplain. Father Wayne, welcome to Women of Grace today. Nice, well, thank you. Nice to be here. You know, I'm so excited that we are discussing this particular topic, and I have longed to do this. And it's, it's such a pleasure for me to have you here, Wayne, because we've known each other for like 30 years, your wife Bridget, uh, members of the parish that I've been a member of for 30-some oh, years. And to be able to speak about such a marvelous relic as the Shroud is truly a privilege. And and I know that your interest began as a result of really trying to debunk the Shroud. That's exactly right. I'm always the Doubting Thomas person. And uh, my background is limited to medical science. And I have a little bit of a specialty in allergy. So actually, I never heard of this uh, growing up Catholic in grammar school and high school and at the University of Notre Dame. It uh, would never reach my ears until about 1979 I just saw it on television and I said this this has to be too good to be true There has to be something wrong with it I have to I have to find out for myself is this scientifically accurate so that started my interest and uh, I had so where do I begin is the question and the only thing that I knew the most about I guess was allergy and pollen so I looked at all the data I could get my hands on about the pollen on the shroud quite convinced uh, after that that it was accurate and authentic then I slipped over to the blood clots and uh, serum formation and the flow of blood and read uh, Barbet's book on uh, Dr. Calvary and slowly it dawned on me that this could be right. And, and that's an amazing thing to even consider, it isn't, Father, that we would have the actual burial cloth of Jesus and the shroud in and of itself does contain many, many various secrets. And I kind of liken it to the other icon that we have, which is the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And as science continues to make advances in technology, we learn more and more about these two remarkable relics. Really. I, you know, I was introduced in the same way. It was uh, the doctor at Calvary that was the first serious thing that I had read about the shroud. But I was privileged as a history lover. I've always been interested in anything that would kind of flesh out this whole very important event historically as well as, of course, spiritually and religiously. But in uh, 1998, I was privileged to be there for the display of the shroud right at the very beginning of that display. Mm -hmm. And it hadn't been shown in 20 years, so I had never had that opportunity. The shroud, of course, had been under uh, the control of, belonged to the Savoy family, the royal family of Italy, and all of this. So uh, it was an awesome privilege to be living in Europe at the time and then have a whole busload of students that were willing to sacrifice whatever it took to get right. to Turin for that very important event. And it was awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm so uh, happy because our viewers, all of you, are going to be treated to a visual treat all week long. And we are going to be using the very slides that Dr. Phillips has amassed on the Shroud. And you've got a first group of these that kind of gives us a little bit of this background that, that we're talking about. And, privilege that you've both had to see the Shroud in person. Right. Uh, obviously, many of our Holy Fathers, including now current Pope Benedict XVI and his beautiful predecessor, Blessed John Paul II, and predecessors prior to, have venerated this Shroud. So let's take a look sure. at this first group of slides. And I'm going to let you be okay. sort of like our tour guide, if you All will, right, Wayne, and lead us through as we take a peek at what we have and the knowledge that we've gained about the Shroud. So let's put those up there and see what we've got going on right now. And here's the very first slide that we've got. And it shows our Holy Father, John Paul II, venerating the Shroud. Well, I always show this one first to show the world that uh, there was a very important person that was interested in the shroud. So hopefully that gets people's attention right off the bat. 
So obviously, uh, Pope John Paul II was very interested in this route. Yeah. So normally when I try to present the information, we start um, from a non-scientific point, but actually, you could actually say this is, a re this is out of the Bible, and the Bible exists, mm -hmm. so this, the scientific statement would be that this is from Mark, and the quote from Mark is that uh, uh, Joseph Arimathea uh, uh, went and, and, and got a expense of linen and took the body down from the cross and wrapped the body, and that's where the, the, the biblical point starts and gets us into the science. Yeah. Well, let's move forward with the slides and, and see once we establish that from sacred scripture where we end up. And here we go, and we find ourselves so then, moving forward. Right. Okay. Next, the next slide, yes. This shows you how the body was laid on the shroud. The shroud was uh, uh, 14 feet long, so the body was laid on the bottom half, and then the top half was folded back over uh, our Lord's body. Uh, and as you can see, the arms look quite stiff, the arms look, and the legs are quite stiff, so it's in a state of rigor mortis. But this is good to start with, because this is, this is the uh, typical Jewish custom burial system that, uh, that where we think the shroud uh, actually covered Jesus' body. Okay, and let's go to the next slide. Now this is the actual Shroud of Turin, and as you can see on the left side, this is a uh, the, the front image of a man, you can see working from the center of the cloth, his face, his chest, you can get an idea of this, his arms and then to the left, his legs. And on the right side is the back image. So you see the back of his head, his back, his legs. So, so we have very important points here. This is a 14 foot long cloth, three foot wide, which completely coordinates with the biblical cubit system of four cubits by one cubit, interesting. Very interesting. So the image also, when we speak of authenticity, which I like to actually put as the theme of the conversation, this man is nude, and that would be anathema for any artist in medieval times to create uh, God and our Savior in a nude position. So let's start right off the bat that this is believable because this is a nude man. Yeah, and that is one of the contentions that we frequently hear is that this was something that, that was devised in the middle evil ages. But what you're doing for us is taking us all the way back to sacred scripture where the, the burial cloth is described now and pointing out to us why in fact this particular piece of fabric is very likely to be that same piece that did in fact cover our Lord. Now the history of the shroud is really quite amazing, but let's continue with our, okay. with our uh, slides here and see what you have to show us next okay. with regard to the image itself. And I love this because you've got it all lined up and uh, you've hopefully got it Hopefully it's logical <laughs> sense. <laughs> okay, uh, good. This is a close up now of the front image and you can see going to the head figure, you can see the uh, blood trickling on the forehead, you can see the long hair, you can see the mustache and beard effect, you can see two prominent, actually four prominent triangular uh, images, which actually are burn marks. So the image itself is in the center. And to start out with a little more authenticity comment, this was a major fire and the image itself was not destroyed hardly at all by this fire. Wow. So I always like to point out that that's a nice little accident. And as you go further down, you can see the um, left arm of Jesus there actually uh, with the wrist and the blood coming out of the wrist. We'll talk about that later. And down the leg. So this is a close up. And what's amazing is that this image in the 21st century, after all the science that's been uh, added and done on this shroud, we don't know exactly what made the image. We have theories, but we'll get into that later. Yes, I know, later in the week, and some of these theories are so very exciting and really could not have been developed until this particular moment in history, which is what I find so fascinating, mm -hmm. is that you know we as Catholics do not fear science and we do not fear reason. That's right. we, we embrace those, and science and reason seem to always bear out the truth of the faith, don't they, Father? Absolutely. But you know, that is one of the great lies of our time, is that there is this conflict, and science and reason, you know, are far apart. Yeah. But as you said, the church has been a clear voice on this. Yeah. Well, now, the shroud has this amazing history because it traveled all over the place, and it wasn't particularly mm -hmm. well taken care of in its travels either. Right. And even the fact that it was, uh, I, I would say probably reverently handled, but yet not protected in any way, is what also helps to give us continued evidence of its authenticity. So take us on this journey now okay. before we go to our break. This All is right. exciting. Well, we have a little summary here of what I like to divide into documented history of the Shroud and circumstantial. And circumstantial is based on mostly uh, Ian Wilson, an English author, of him putting together some of the facts in the past. 
So we'll, we'll, right now, if we patch it through, in the yellow, we can see the shroud, we think, starting in Jerusalem at the time of the crucifixion, and then making its way up to Edessa, Urfa, Turkey, and then to Constantinople, and then in the possession of the Knights, uh, the Crusader Knights, Knights Templar. And then, as you see, I switch it to the white color, and it goes to the documented history. And this is definitely un, uh, undebatable information, where the shroud shows up in documented history in 1355 in Lyre, France, moves to Chambéry, where the fire was, and all these were exhibitions constantly in public, and finally its present location in Turin, Italy. So this is a summary, but we have individual points along the way that we can talk about now. Yes, and let's, let's do that. We're going to continue to move forward here because I want everybody to get a really good sense of this. And so it makes its initial journey from Jerusalem right. to Edessa, Edessa, Edessa in Turkey. So let's yes. take a look at that. And here so we are in this, Edessa. Theoretically, this is how long it was in Edessa, 30 to 914. It was called the image of Edessa. And at the time, uh, the first uh, bishop, one of the first bishops in, in uh, Caesarea in Jerusalem was Asubius. And around 265, uh, he was speaking of the, uh, the, the uh, kind of a story, uh, maybe mythological, about a, a King Apgar. We know King Apgar did exist in Odessa, but there were six King Apgars. <laughs> so we don't know quite which one. But the, the way the, uh, the story goes is that while Jesus was alive, King Apgar actually found out he was a miracle worker, and King Apgar had something like leprosy, and sent a letter to Jesus, and Jesus received the letter, and it was a request for Jesus to come to Edessa and cure him. And Jesus wrote back in a letter saying, uh, I can't make it right now, but I'm going to send a representative uh, later to help, to help you. So the, uh, the, the uh, belief then goes on that the representative did show up, around 35 A.D., and brought the shroud and cured the king, King Apgar. And at that point, he made it law of the land. This was now going to be a Christian communication, a Christian community. Mm -hmm. And it was from that point on, unfortunately, until he died. And then when he died, his son took over, who uh, was an atheist. Mm. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at Father as, mm -hmm. as you're telling us this little mythological story, yes. and I want to yes. underline the fact yes. that this is mythological, yes. and you're making funny faces. Well, you know, <laughs> so. it, it, it is humorous to think about Jesus writing a letter, <laughs> no, know. you know, in order to communicate this to the king there. But, again... No yeah. one's found the letter, right? Well, no one knows. But, Doesn't you know, John tell us at the end of Revelation that there are so many oh, absolutely. other you know, things that happened in our Lord's life? So Could never be all recorded. recorded. Right. So it's a possibility. Yes. But nonetheless, it helps to explain how the shroud may well have ended up right. in Edessa. And uh, I think it's probably, um, we've got a little bit more time. So let's go okay. forward to the next slide right. and take a peek at what transpires in Edessa before we go to that break. Well, what happens in Edessa uh, after the king dies is that the uh, faithful hide the shroud in a wall. And it stays there for almost 400 years until a flood, a documented flood, happened about 565. And at the time of the flood, the wall was destroyed, and it was a rediscovery of the shroud at that point. So the people at, at that point were more of a Christian demeanor. And uh, what now we get into a little bit of science that proves maybe the authenticity of the shroud, if we want to go to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. All right, now this is the appearance on mosaics in Edessa before the uh, discovery of the shroud. This is the appearance of the typical artists of what they would portray Jesus' face, clean, shaven, young, Roman person. And then the next slide would show another example of Jesus being young, clean, shaven. Now after the mosaics, a date to 565 forward, and even to modern times, if we go to the next slide, we can, this is a discovery of the uh, shroud 525. And the next slide will show the new mosaics. So, so hmm. from this point forward, Jesus is portrayed as long hair, mustache, beard, completely different image, and all the artists of the time to our present day, this is what Jesus is portrayed as looking at. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and here we have um, the this Christ Panda Crater painting. painting from 550 A.D. And let's stop on that point. And when we come back from our break, we're going to pick up right there, friends, as we continue to explore this visual treat of the shroud and learn so much about the burial cloth of Jesus. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Okay.
Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Dr. Wayne Phillips, and he is giving us a visual treat as he walks us through the history of the Shroud of Turin. Now, many of you might recall that the Shroud of Turin is claimed to be the burial cloth of Jesus. And what we're discovering today are the reasons why we could probably begin to believe if we wanted to that this is indeed the burial cloth of Jesus. Father Ed is with us on set today as well. As you know, he's our Holy Cross Father and he's our theological advisor and consultant. And you know, I'm just finding this so interesting, Father, to begin to uh, really allow my imagination to believe that, mm -hmm. in fact, here is something that we can touch that, that has the image of our Lord and Savior on it. I mean, that to me is, um, Faith enhancing. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's, it's another, it's akin in my mind to the experience of going to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. My very first trip to Jerusalem I came away with a, a, a phrase in my mind and heart that said, the stones speak. Mm. Now, it wasn't because this is the actual street that Jesus walked on that would have to go down a way. But it's just that everything that's there that is takes us back these millennia, you know, speaks powerfully to our mm -hmm. faith if we'll listen. Shroud is the same thing. If we'll listen, if faith will cooperate. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's exactly what uh, I'm hoping that our programs do today, Wayne. And I want to thank you so much for sharing with us your knowledge and expertise. You are a member of the Shroud Science Group. It's mm -hmm. a really esteemed group of scientists. So I'm really pleased that, that we were able to have you come <laughs> to our show. Let's continue with this journey sure. of the Shroud. When we uh, mm -hmm. went to our break, we were showing a picture, an image of Jesus uh, Pantocrator. Mm -hmm. And you want to take us to another image on the, it's, it, read well, for us there what it is, it, the Hungarian? It'd be interesting if we could fast forward to the Hungarian Prey Manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, if they could just go through the slides. We okay. Could, well, let's, we as they're doing that, it. why don't you tell us why this might be a very important well, slide for us it, to look it, at? Well, it, it actually dates for sure to 1196. Mm -hmm. So it kind of corroborates the fact that, uh, which we're going to get into another day, the carbon dating might be an error. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is, it has five parts of it, five things in this painting that that everybody really believes it would be impossible to happen by accident. Mm -hmm. So the person that actually did the painting had to be looking at the shroud or a copy of the shroud when this was done. Yes. And I think you'll be very amazed when you see the five items that we're talking about. Okay, let's uh, put up that image of the Hungarian Prey... Prey Manuscript. Hungarian Prey Manuscript and take a look at it. And what number That's, is that? That is it. They oh, found there we it got right it. There, the see, they're so great. Great shot. We have a great control room. Everybody in it's fabulous. Well, this is the upper piece of the picture. It has a lower and an upper piece. Uh, and I'll just, since we have this first, I'll talk about the lower piece. As you can see on the bottom, there is a scraggly line uh, pattern. That is the herringbone tweed of the actual shroud. The herringbone tweed is what the shroud uh, sewing design is. And if you can appreciate, there's also to the right of the six, down below, there are like four little dots, an upside down L, and it's facing to the left. So those little four dots are burn holes that hmm. we're gonna show you from the, the shroud itself. So the, so the theory would then be, uh, in 1196, somebody had to be looking at something that was herringbone tweed with four burn holes exactly in that configuration. That's amazing. On the next slide, we're gonna see more evidence. Oh, here's a close up. Here's a close up of the little uh, black, uh, white circled holes, four burn holes in the herringbone weed. So the next slide. This is the actual Shroud of Turin, and there's your four burn holes in an L shape. And you can very visibly yes. see the herringbone tweed. Yes. Next slide. No, nope, we got to go back because we missed the first one. First one has the body of our Lord. Um, you can go back about three. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll go back well, three what slides. What we're going to see when we get there is, first of all, again, a portrayal of the body of Christ on a drawing nude, mm -hmm. his arms crossed mm -hmm. exactly as the shroud is, and missing thumbs, which the shroud has missing thumbs. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that also. Okay, so there if, it is. So if we go back and here it is. So here you see the nude body, the arms are crossed in the position of the shroud, and you see four fingers but no thumb. So now I've actually listed for you five items that would have to be an accident of 1196 that the person that painted this picture decided to put in the picture. And I don't know about you, but five accidents in a row are overwhelming 
to, for me to believe it was an accident. That's okay. right. Why don't you summarize those five for us right. again? So the first is the, the nude image, the crossed arms, the lack of thumbs, the herringbone tweed, and the four holes that are in the shape of an L. Wow, you sound like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> or the clue this game. <laughs> first time I read that, I was pretty excited. I'll bet that you were. I can well imagine it. And it's very, very fascinating. Let's move forward now from this particular documentation that we have, which okay. you consider to be one of the uh, most fascinating and, uh, what would I want to say, corroborating uh, mm -hmm. bits of evidence that we've got sure. that this is, in fact, the burial cloth of Jesus. And what, what are we going to see Let's next? Let's go to the next one that they had, uh, looked like it was a knight uh, kneeling down. Oh, yes, that was after yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the actual visual yeah, there you of the go. church. So, yes. so after um, the uh, Fourth Crusade, where, they, uh, where the, unfortunately the Roman uh, armies were attacking the Greek Christians, the, uh, the shroud was supposedly then taken by the Crusaders and ended up, in, we think, in the possession of the Knights, the Crusader Knights, Knights Templar, for the next 150 years. And this is a uh, picture depicting the worship of a, of a man, an image, a uh, cloth, by the Crusaders in one of their many castles and forts. So what's interesting is that in 2009, Bar Dr. Barbara Frail, a Vatican archivist, actually found a quote saying, in 1287, the Knights Templar worshiped a bearded man. Hmm. And this was just found in 2009. So the excitement is of all the new things that are coming out in the 21st century. Yeah, and, th and that's what I, it, it's, it's almost as if the Lord is trying to reveal so much to us right now that, you know, we're, we're living in a time where faith is challenged. And I think that God is pulling out all stops to help us come into a deeper exactly. understanding and appreciation of the relationship that he desires to have with us. Let's move forward sure. on our journey. I'm loving this. Yep. Next slide would be. Okay, now we have documented history. At this point, Geoffrey de Charnay is uh, definitely documented to be the owner of the shroud at this point and starts to display the shroud in the Lyrae Church. And he is the um, great, great, great grandson of this man of the same name that comes into the literature uh, at the time of the, of the takeover of Constantinople, Geoffrey de Charnay. Same name, three generations or hmm. four generations separated. Next slide. Then the, the uh, ownership gets transferred to the House of Savoy, the future Father kings of Italy, yes. Mm -hmm. And the next slide. And then it ends up where it is now at the Turin Cathedral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is the history, the That's circumstantial the history. and the documented. Wow, it's, it's a fascinating history. And now the shroud, uh, uh, Father, you mentioned is, you saw it and hadn't been exhibited in 20, 20 years. years. And I know point. that Pope Benedict venerated the shroud back in 2010 right. and it hadn't been shown for 10 years. Right. Now, let's talk a little bit about what goes on at, at the cathedral and the care for the shroud at this point in time. Well, I had the chance of seeing the shroud with, with my wife Bridget in May 2010, and uh, at that point it was displayed for the uh, exposition, but it's kept in a uh, almost a bomb-proof glass con structure with steel, and it's kept in an argon gas. And you, you cannot actually see it, but you can see a replica of it. If you go to the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist now, you will see a replica hanging over it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's still a, a nice experience to be that close. But the next uh, exposition, I don't know when that's... Uh, Mm. when it's going probably to be. Probably 10 more years, so yeah. we might have to wait to 2020 or something. Oh, I would love to go if God is good and lets me you remain should. on this you face should. of the earth until that time. Well, ownership actually was transferred oh, right. from the House of Savoy, I think it was 1985, yes, right? Yes, exactly right. And that's when the shroud was actually given to the Vatican. So mm -hmm. it's under the Vatican's care now mm -hmm. since 1985. Well, I, and I know uh, when we come back tomorrow, friends, one of the things that we're going to be doing is taking a look at uh, the Shroud Research Project Group, and we're going to be getting into even more of the science that uh, we can find inside of the Shroud, which, I mean, it's absolutely mind-boggling. But in order to uh, qualify for the, the opportunity to investigate the Shroud, study the Shroud, and, and uh, be part of that team that helps us to unlock its secrets, uh, it's not not a small matter, is it? Oh, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands of hours, thousands of scientists have studied. It's the most studied artifact in the world. Wow. And you have all had the opportunity to go on this marvelous journey with Father Ed and myself as uh, Dr. Wayne Phillips has led us along. And we're going to be back tomorrow and discuss the same thing. I want to remind you, we've got the program today available for you. And in addition to that, we have all of the shows that will be coming up available for you as we present them to you. So be sure to give us a call at 1 
1-800-558-5452 or get out there to our website www.womenofgrace.com we've got all kinds of good things for you also want to rec recommend an excellent uh, DVD presentation did Jesus really rise from the dead what a great great video presentation it's done by Ignatius Productions yours truly has a small cameo towards the end of it so you might want to take a peek at that and we're always eager to help you develop your life of faith and so I want to recommend Padre Pio's spiritual direction for everyday living just get out there to the website all there for you we love you God bless you now bye bye Hello everyone and welcome to Women of Grace. I'm Janet Benkovic. Occasionally in the pursuit of scientific investigation, contradictory findings can seem to render hundreds of hours and years of research invalid. Such was the case with the Shroud of Turin when, in 1988, further study on this fascinating relic nearly came to a complete stop. It is yet another amazing story that eventually helped to uncover even more of the Shroud's secrets. Join us today as guest Dr. Wayne Phillips takes us into this moment of its thrilling history. Dr. Wayne Phillips is our guest for this Women of Grace series, Secrets of the Shroud. Today, he is going to share with us about a moment in time that almost halted all forward movement in the study of this amazing relic. It happened in 1988. Let's welcome Dr. Wayne Phillips, a medical doctor with a specialty in allergies, and our own Father Edmund Sylvia, a Holy Cross father and the theological advisor and chaplain to Women of Grace. Father Wayne, welcome back today. Thanks, Thank Jenna. you. Thank you know, you. I, I have been so happy happy with the way in which you have led us on this journey of discovery about the Shroud and revealing so many secrets that until this moment in the history of man, because of the advances in technology that have been made, uh, remained, if you will, kind of a, a, a secret. And we're beginning to discover so many things that it's leading me in a very definitive direction that this is indeed the burial cloth of our Lord Jesus Christ. But 1988 was a significant year, not for a happy moment, but for a moment that almost halted everything. And it affected you personally in your study, didn't it? It was a bad year, yes, yes. All my uh, belief and authenticity and scientific uh, subject matter all went out the window with one particular scientific experiment. So let's talk about that. What was it called and what does it mean? It's called carbon dating. And carbon dating is based on the scientific principle that every living creature uh, breathes carbon-14, which is radioactive from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So as soon as any living thing dies, there's a limited amount of carbon-14 in their cellular elements. So after a number of years, there's a mathematical formula that shows a decay or a lack of the carbon-14 uh, radiated um, elements uh, being there so they can actually tell you how old the subject is by how much carbon-14 is left. Okay. And is that how many of the artifacts that are uncovered through paleontology and other sciences yes. help us to determine yes. these Yes, if things? it was a living thing, then the mm -hmm. carbon-14 would be uh, still there up to 20, 30,000 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, there's that saying, Father Ed, you know, where um, uh, a person who has faith, for a person who has faith, mm -hmm. no proof is necessary. For mm -hmm. a person who has no faith, no proof is enough. And so when we hit these stumbles along the road, you know, how do we approach those with an attitude of faith in the fact that God, our God is a God of revelation and he's always about the business of revealing himself to us? Well, that's the key, is that God is about revelation. And revelation comes in a variety of ways. One of the dangers some have said about the whole study of the shroud would be to go to the other extreme of, of an over-dependence on science as if science was going to answer everything mm -hmm. that the shroud is about. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Right. If science could even answer all of that, it would still leave us in a position where other ways of coming to all of this would still be necessary spiritually, mm -hmm. you know, historically. All of these things, part of the revelation, all of this is ever going to be a part of the way in which we have to process this mm -hmm. and come to something beyond just, again, a, a, something in our reason. Yeah, and I, I think God always leaves us with those questions just so mm -hmm. that we can exercise faith. Mother Angelica, of course, comes to mind. You know, mm -hmm. she is, is uh, 
I, I would have to say, holds a very special place. I would say she's the, the queen of, of catchy phrases that helps for us to understand difficult things in, in easy to understand everyday ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of her sayings was that, you know, faith is having uh, one foot in the air and the other foot on a banana peel. <laughs> you know, you just, and, and, and I think that there's something to be said about that. Mm -hmm. God wants us to exercise faith in Him, not faith in the natural elements. Right. However, the reality is that the investigation of the shroud has helped for many to come into a deeper faith uh, and has permitted them really to cross that threshold into the mysteries that God desires for us to know uh, through the workings of His Holy Spirit. So this moment now, which is kind of like a blemish, but God works all things to the good, actually turned out to be a positive. But let's talk about what the carbon dating, okay. uh, this attempt to age the shroud based on that kind of scientific um, investigation yielded in 1988. Okay. All right, can we have the first slide? Yeah, we've got some slides for this. Awesome. I always love this, this is such a Well, in 1988, thing. after hundreds of experiments showed that the uh, shroud was an authentic uh, relic, the uh, carbon dating came forward and the, um, the media loved the result, in my opinion. That's, that's a mm -hmm. non-scientific statement. Mm -hmm. But they could say that the Shroud, the Shroud of Turin was a fake. And these are the three heads of the three carbon-14 labs. Next slide. And more, now, more New York headlines. Shroud of Turin made in the 1300s, analysis finds. So the media was very happy with all this, in my opinion. Next slide. And they went as far to say as uh, anyone who thinks that the man of the shroud is Jesus is a flat earth believer. It's a medieval forgery. So the carbon dating summer 1988 came back at 1260 to 1390. I was devastated personally and people that are way smarter than me were devastated. Next slide. Until, until I had to be a miraculous event because Sue Benford, a nurse in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, I'm not even sure if she was Catholic at that point, uh, decided to watch television in 1997 and saw the shroud being uh, talked about on the History Channel and uh, got interested in it. And she got enough interest to contact uh, the original Sturp team photographer as a website, shroud.com, Barry Schwartz, and asked for photocopies of some of the, uh, the herringbone tweed patterns of the shroud to actually see patterns of cloth on the sample site. So with some kind of determination that was overwhelming, she noticed there was irregularity, irregularities in it. But this is not a scientist, this is a nurse. This is a nurse who had to overcome cancer as a child, who had to uh, go on to, to make herself uh, actually an accomplished woman because she won the world championship weightlifting in her class of 98 pounds. Wow. She went from cancer to world champion weightlifting. So we're talking somebody with a lot of fortitude and guts. So she put the same energy mm -hmm. into not giving up that the shroud was not a medieval forgery. And uh, by through Barry Schwartz was uh, connected to Joe Marino, who uh, at the time was uh, a monk. And he was a fan of the shroud all the way back to 1977 and had collected every book that ever was written. And he kind of worked her through her information. And after try to, trying to understand that her, her information wasn't totally out of kilter with reality, they got together and wrote a paper. And the paper was presented at a shroud conference in 2001. And it was accepted by many, many scientists, except the most important one. I think we can see on the next slide what happened next. I just want to interject while we're putting that slide up. Sure. And I just want to say, uh, you know, just to, to make a, a bit of a distinction here, women are all about the details. You know, and, and sometimes, uh, intuitively, you look at something and you say, something's amiss here, and you're not quite certain what it is. But she had the guts, I think, to respond to female intuition, if you will, that, that gift that women have to see things globally and to investigate why something was maybe just bothering her, niggling at her interiorly. Something's mm -hmm. not right. What is it? But even, you know, to, to ask for those pictures and to want to look at the herringbone uh, uh, fabric, you know, and, and the, 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 the textile pa patterns, uh, patterns mm -hmm. was, I think, quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yay. Well, I think it's, you're right. The fortitude is overwhelming. It is indeed. Yes. So what do we see in this next slide? So what we see up? is actually the, uh, the material she was looking at. And you can see the little black lines on the right are pointing at all the uh, not matching 
uh, connections between what they think is medieval patch on the right and shroud on the left. And I, there's a line going down the center that kind of divides the old material from the new material. So this is what actually was in her paper in 2001 that was published in Chemistry Today, 2008. Now I need to put a little dig in on the carbon <laughs> dating because that never made it to peer-reviewed journals. They made it to the magazine Nature. That's a regular magazine. The carbon oh. dating was flawed a lot in the presentation, never made a scientific journal. This is a scientific journal. And with this publication, she then contacted Ray Rogers. Ray Rogers was the chemist analyst from the original American STIRP team, the head of the textile division, and um, was uh, connected to Ray Rogers through Barry Schwartz through a phone call. And Ray Rogers being real kind of, uh, you got to prove it to me kind of guy, uh, said, oh, that's nonsense. Give me five minutes, I'll call you back. I got the original slides, I got samples, so I'm going to tell you what baloney her study is. So about three to four hours later, he calls back Barry Schwartz and says, they're onto something. There's cotton all over these things. We've missed this. My gracious me. So yeah. Ray Rogers, who yeah. was three years from dying of cancer, hmm. who had given up all research on the shroud, decided to get together with some of his other PAL experts and they did a tremendous study over two to three years that has now proven that the job done uh, by the sampling was completely flawed. Not that, the, not that the carbon dating labs were flawed. No. It, they did a good job. They were given a bad sample and the sample was actually mm -hmm. a medieval patch job. Mm -hmm. And I can work you through the next steps Let's watch of what that. happened there. Let's take a peek, friends. The, uh, this is a picture through the years of the shroud being displayed, and these are the local church clerical people. Uh, and you can see in the top left-hand corner, there was a lot of handling of the shroud in that area. So we don't know what, what exactly is the reason, but this part of the shroud was either damaged, or there's another theory that Margaret de Charnay, which is a great-great-granddaughter of Geoffrey de Charnay, willed a corner of the shroud to her church in Chambray, and at the time of her death, a piece of it was cut off, put into her church, and then uh, I think it's King Louis, with all the medieval tapestry artists of the, of the, of the age, were able to mend together a cotton replacement. Uh -huh. So that's how the theory goes. When we go to the next slide, we can see this is the shroud itself, and up in the left-hand corner is where a single sample was taken. Now that's key on the error of the sampling. Prior to this, an international protocol over three years of study from the Americans and the Germans and the French and the Italians, they all decided to have six sample sites and three labs to study it. But when the day came to take the samples, the head scientist in Turin threw that out and decided to take only one sample. Unfortunately, he picked the absolute worst position of the shroud where there was, as we'll see later, uh, a patch job done. Hmm. Let's see the next slide. This is the actual one sample site being done and the uh, international protocol recommending six sites. You can see they're leaning over and all their officiality. Next slide. And this is exactly what happened. This is a picture of the sample. Now the vertical line down the middle on the left is a piece of the sample that's still in turn, still hasn't been touched, they have it under control. And on the right you can see there's a horizontal line with proposed patch uh, above the line. Now that is thought to be cotton and the, thought in the part below is thought to be the linen of the shroud. So that section to the right of the vertical line was cut into four pieces. Two pieces sent to the lab in Arizona, one to uh, Germany and one to England. Mm -hmm. And the interesting part is the two that went to Arizona was on the far left one and the far right. And as you go from left to right, their own carbon dating became old, younger and younger and younger. So the Arizona one on the far left and the Arizona one on the far right disagreed with itself by 200 years. Oh, my goodness sakes. Meaning more cotton. Well, we have got to leave it here. And when we come back, we're going to pick up with our discussion today. And friends, I'm wondering if you're finding this as fascinating as I'm finding it and Father Ed is finding it, let us know. You can contact us at www.womenofgrace.com and just hit contact us and send us an email. Or you can avoid all of that and just go to info at womenofgrace.com. We'll be right back with our guest today, Dr. Wayne Phillips, and we will continue our exploration at the Shroud of Turin. Stay with us.
Welcome back, friends. You know, I do want to remind you that at our website, www.womenofgrace.com, we have all kinds of wonderful resources for you. And I want to mention to you that two of those very good resources happens to be our social network for women called Grace Place. All you need to do is to click on the icon there and it'll take you right over. We want you to become a member so that you can meet up with your sisters from all across the world and discover the great gift of your authentic femininity. In addition to that, we want to encourage you to check out WOG Exclusive. All of our programs available for you there and you can go all the way back to programs that Father Ed and I did, oh my goodness, almost 20 years ago, dare I say it. So we invite you to get out there and check out what we've got. Our guest today, this week, is uh, Dr. Wayne Phillips. We're talking about the secrets of the shroud. And you know, Wayne, when we went to that break, you were sharing with us about a very key moment, and that was when Arizona disagreed with itself, in a sense, discovering uh, the, the, the whole error that was made with the carbon dating sample. And I'm thinking to myself that, um, you know, when, when you think about these kinds of scientific investigations, there's always going to be bumps in the road. The thing that really impresses me, however, is that it was pressed through okay. so that we can come yeah. out on the other side of it. Uh, but share with us once again why that discovery of the piece of cloth that was different is so key to understanding the actual antiquity of the cloth. Well, with the Arizona uh, controversy, that made it a little more... Uh, uh, interesting that there were mistakes in the carbon dating. So by the time you add that together with Sue Benford and Joe Marino's theories and start accepting their paper, Ray Rogers had enough gumption to go back and look at his slides and then had came back and said, I think they're right. I think they have something important. So he started his study and we'll see, I actually have uh, photomicrographs of his study. Oh, let's take a look so at that. So we can actually let's see what he there. said. This is Ray. Uh, 2005, and his uh, study was published in Thermokima Acta, volume 425, which is one of the leading journals of chemistry in the world, in January 2005. He has now since passed away. Next slide. Now here we can see what he was examining, and this is in the Ray sample, a 1973 sample, right next to the carbon dating sample, the same area, 73 versus 1988. And you can see the linen fibers and the cotton fibers. Like, like the bamboo structure going uh, vertically, that is the linen, and the little slice coming across, little lacy light effect, is the cotton. So you can see right now there's cotton mixed with linen in the ray sample, right next door to carbon dating. Next slide. Now here is actually the carbon dating slide. And you can see the meticulousness of the medieval patch people, the, wow. the weavers. This Amazing. is an in reweaving, and you can see linen being touched directly into the fiber of cotton, hmm. end to end. Next slide. And here's some more of the carbon-14 sample itself, not the rays, but the carbon-14 sample itself, with labeled cotton fibers and linen fibers all in the same microscopic field. Next slide. And here's another end-to-end -end splice. On the left, medieval cotton. On the right, the original linen of the original shroud. Now, they were not only well adept at doing sewing, but they were also well, uh, well uh, had great acumen on dyeing. So they had to take white new cotton material and dye it yellow. So uh, Ray was able to discover uh, the different mordants. Next slide. And you can see the chemicals on the fiber itself, the gum arabic uh, that would make the cotton fiber turn yellow to match the color. So the person that wasn't paying close attention, just using his eye, would miss it. So this is how it happened. So this it's remarkable. is this has uh, all been shown now, and it's been in a peer-reviewed paper, and no uh, disbeliever in the science of it has come up with any explanation to refute. His, his work. Yeah. Well, two things uh, grab my attention. Uh, one very temporal and, and one uh, I think that is more spiritual. The one that's more spiritual, obviously, is that we know that the shroud was linen because sacred scripture tells us that the mm -hmm. shroud yeah. or th that covered our Lord was linen. And, and so even the fabric itself is testimony to the fact that this could be. The other thing that grabs me about that is that the uh, the burial cloth of our Lord in sacred scripture was given to uh, our Lord uh, posthumously by Joseph of Arimathea, who was mm -hmm. wealthy. And so it was a very good piece of fabric. And the herringbone pattern of the fabric and the weaving that was in that, obviously withstanding all of these years, right. is testimony to that. The, the other thing, that the more temporal aspect of this, is the fact that uh, the craftsmen 
of medieval Europe were really quite amazing oh, yeah. to mm -hmm. take such care. And that in and of itself not only speaks to their abilities, but it seems to speak to me about their belief and veneration for what it is that they were handling mm. and that they didn't want to do sloppy work. Um, I think back to uh, you know the, the men who built the cathedrals and those who mm. created and, and made the sacred vessels. Mm. Mm. I mean these were works that they were doing unto the Lord mm. so they mm. wanted it to be as perfect as they could and when you show those samples you see the, 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 the precision almost you can feel the love that they poured yeah, into yeah. that, you know? It's an art. It's Remember, an art. And especially in the medieval time, uh, I think many people, until you visit a museum, thinking of the Vatican or others, where they have these great tapestries yeah. hanging yeah. on the wall, you begin to appreciate that uh, not only did that function in a variety of ways, but it was art as well. Mm -hmm. It was. You know? Well, and the monks, you know, who, who transcribed uh, sacred scripture and the way in which manuscripts, they, right? Yes, and the, the manuscripts love. were just, but it was the same love. It was yes. art, but it was art that was, if you will, lifted up in the service of the things of God. Sure. So all of that speaks, you know, on a different level <laughs> to what was held in common mm -hmm. in relation to belief in this particular mm -hmm. article or garment, piece of right. fabric. Um, take us forward now. So what, what, how does all of this fit in now with, with, in a certain sense, um, answered the carbon dating issue, and science continues to move forward now. The brakes are off. We're going ahead, guys. Right. Everybody's rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. I'm personally say, good Lord, this is resurrected. <laughs> this route is back. And, mm -hmm. not, and I'm just an observer, but the real scientists got their enthusiasm back, and it's been a tremendous explosion of data. Now, most importantly, not on just the details of what the shroud shows us, but on maybe what the image, uh, how the image was created and what kind of energy supply the image. And so a lot of things we're learning, which could be very interesting to talk about. Yes, and we're going to approach that in our next program. But for the moment, I want to explore this whole element of faith a little bit more. And I'm going to ask you personally, has your own life of faith increased as a result of your study, Wayne? Has it been a cerebral approach totally, or has it in some way um, stirred up within you maybe a greater appreciation for the ways in which God interacts with us? That's a better way to say it. My faith is the same. Mm -hmm. With or without the shroud, I still believe in everything, all the concepts of Christianity. But it's uniqueness because I've never been able to say that the little bit I know of science meshes so well with an object that proves that what I believe in my soul is accurate. Mm -hmm. So, and, I, and that's the message I want to get through to people. That's why mm -hmm. I'm involved in making presentations. I think it's unprecedented in the history of the world that the science is there that can now connect us to what we believe. Not because we need it, but because it's just so wonderful that we live at a time when it's possible. Yeah. Well, I just, I think of the gracious gratuity of God, mm -hmm. I mean, who is permitting us to live in this time. And we live in a time, I think, where faith is, is greatly challenged, um, in, in certainly through the secular culture in which we live and the mores that we have adopted as a culture. And when we have evidence like this, it's almost as if heaven itself is shouting down to us saying, hello, what are you thinking? I mean, take a look, you know? Yeah. And, you know, Father, I'm thinking that, you know, we as Catholics um, hold the passion of our Lord with, um, oh, I would have to say, great spiritual significance. We oh, even have absolutely. an entire season called Lent that we set aside once a year to meditate upon the prize of our salvation. And so, in reference to um, something like this, where we explore the, the 120 lashes yeah. that this individual received, or that cap of thorns on the head, it's meant, and I think God would have us, enter more deeply into that mystery. Well, you know, it's, it's the thing with the camera where we have the lens to be able to come in close mm -hmm. and see the details, and then, of course, the ability to pan back and see the whole. Yes. I, well, the scientist in uh, Wayne certainly has him there with the details. I must say the theologian teacher has me back further, wanting to put the cross in the context of what it really is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, that again, as you've said, this is the 
saving action of uh, loving God on behalf of all mankind. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has to be pondered with a certain kind of distance uh, because none of us really is uh, worthy to come ever too close yeah, that's there. Good. Yeah. You know? Well, I think one of the most uh, beautiful reflections on, on the Shroud is one that I made reference to a day or so ago in our program where Pope Benedict XVI mm -hmm. spent um, uh, time reflecting upon the importance of Holy Saturday, right. talking about the Shroud being the icon of the mystery of Holy Saturday. I could sit with that and meditate on that yes. for a long time. <laughs> and you know what, friends? We want you to do that, and we're going to actually give you a link. Uh, Father, we'll mm -hmm. put it up uh, sure. in underneath Father Ed's uh, pics uh, on our website underneath the blog section so that you can go out and read that. And I would encourage you to take that into your time of prayer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace. I'm Janet Benkovic. As technology continues to advance, so too does the ability to uncover more and more of the secrets of the Shroud of Turin. Today, our guest will share with us about the new discoveries technology has made possible and the new theories these discoveries have spawned. Join us as we continue our discussion on science and the shroud. Science and reason are not antithetical to belief and faith. In fact, they often are the means by which faith grows and develops. And such is the case with the study and scientific research that undergirds investigation of the Shroud of Turin. As technology burgeons, so too does its usefulness in helping to uncover the secrets this marvelous relic holds. Here to talk with us today about the new discovery science has now made possible and what they reveal about the Shroud is Dr. Wayne Phillips, an allergist and member of the esteemed Shroud Science Group. Also with us is our own father, Edmund Sylvia, our theological advisor and our Women of Grace chaplain. Wayne, Father, welcome, welcome back today. Thank you. I, I really uh, have enjoyed this week because I've learned so much, and I thank you for that, Wayne. And it's also, I think, sparked within me uh, a deeper appreciation for this great gift of faith that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I stated, Father, in that open that science and reason are not antithetical mm -hmm. to belief and faith. In fact, they serve each other in terms of purpose and direction, don't they? That's one of the great truths that uh, has to be further revealed in our time because in many ways one of what I call the great lies is just the opposite, that the church has always opposed science and the developments that are part of science and nothing could be further from the truth. Right. Anyone who knows their history of science uh, couldn't come to that conclusion. Well, and, and I think that if you know your history of the church, you'd have to mm -hmm. also come to the same conclusion because science, uh, the church has always upheld and esteemed science. Yes. Uh, that is not to say that occasionally there, there were not statements that were made regarding it, which later proved to be true. But by the same token, so many of the scientific mm -hmm. investigations were really nurtured along by Holy Mother Church. And you're yeah. nodding your head, Wayne. Yeah, so you I agree? totally agree. They gave permission to, to the STIRP team to work on the shroud. Yeah. They had to have a lot of nerve to do that, really. Absolutely. They had no idea what was going to happen. That's right. But I, but I do think that that, once again, uh, points to the, to the, to the uh, credible nature that Holy Mother Church has uh, with regard to the fields of exploration and science and discovery. She doesn't stand back in fear because anything mm -hmm. that's discovered, anything that's discovered is... A discovery about what God has already done, you right, know. Right. So it's just part of revelation, really. Right. And uh, I've enjoyed the programs because you have really helped for us to see that connection and to experience it through this study of the shroud. And there have been continued uh, new discoveries mm -hmm. made because of the technological advances. I can only begin to imagine what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years when we look at it all. All right, the enthusiasm is back since the papers of Ray Rogers. So the enthusiasm has allowed us to go forward with all kinds of new findings. They're just really exciting. Yeah, it would have been such a shame to have allowed that error regarding carbon dating to halt the whole thing. We talked about that yesterday in the program, friends, so if you didn't see it, just, you know, get in touch with us. We'll send you a copy of the DVD or get out there to WOG exclusive, become a member, and you can watch it. Well, I'll tell you what, let's continue our discussion about these new discoveries because okay. they are truly so exciting, friends. Okay. Okay. Well, we see the first slide. 
This is uh, data now presented at the uh, Ohio State University Conference, August 14th to the 17th, 2008. So very recent. Over 60 scientific papers were presented, and I have a few uh, that I'm going to highlight. Next slide. First, we have the limestone at the feet of Jesus on the shroud, samples compared to the limestone of Jerusalem with um, a special electronic uh, electrolysis to, to count ions. And if you can see the matching upper Jerusalem limestone and those little peaks all matching the peaks below. So that is almost a perfect match of the limestone variation between that found on the shroud and that that exists in Jerusalem. So there's another important point that the limestone on a shroud in Lyrae, France matches the limestone in Jerusalem. Yes, and I remember that you shared with us as we were looking at the, uh, I think it was the, um, the image of the shroud that was in the negative where we could see the image of Jesus. You pointed out mm -hmm. that on his feet was lime, there was limestone, right, right on, on right. his feet there. So it's very interesting that that goes all the way uh, in line with this particular finding it's of exciting. the limestone. It's just all over the shroud. Let me see the next slide. We'll get to some other points here. This is really very appropriate because now the uh, close-ups and the high definition have what we think we see on the eyes, over, overlaying the eyes, is what we can think is a minted in, in the year 29, the widow's might, uh, quoted in the Bible. And we think these are over his eyes, uh, the lepton. So this is intriguing because all this pattern, whatever the radiation field was, seems to have left part of this image on the shroud. Oh, really? Yes. Let's see the next slide. And then you can see a little bit of the mitre on the far left, and you can see the, the letters V, C, A, J, which uh, translate to the reign of Pontius Pilate. So it's called the Pontius Pilate coin, which is the mitre or the, the widow's mite. Next slide. Now, this is an attempt in 2004 to, by um, diffusion on the right, to cr create by an, a non-believer the image on the shroud. So what he did was uh, had a friend of his, uh, who looked somewhat like Jesus, put material all over his face and with moisture, put a linen shroud over him, and then the diffusion of the, it almost looks like makeup on the right coming through versus the real shroud on the left. Now, just your eye can easily discern the delicate, intricate details of the image on the left versus the one on the right. So right now, in the 21st century, no one, through many attempts, have been able to duplicate or even get close to this image. Isn't that interesting? Technology cannot duplicate what technology has discovered. Yes. I love it. Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> first for humanity. Next slide. All right, so the real fun comes with what we have found now between 2001 and 2010. So what do we think? At this point, what is the theory? How did the image get on the cloth? Next slide. All right, so this is Jesus with the Shroud of Turin tightly wrapping his body. And you can see the blood is, is touching. It's connected. It's intertwined with the threads. So think of yourself when you've had a cut and you bled into your long sleeve shirt. That is part of a being of your shirt, your clot on your arm and your skin is all one. So where this image had to be made, something had to happen that did not disturb those clots. Those clots on the Shroud of Turin are perfect, symmetrical, with serous fluid outlines that have not been yanked off. So the body of Christ did not wake up, throw off the shroud, and stand up and walk out. He had to do something else that I'll save for a little punchline. Okay. Next slide. Um, the other point that proves this is um, you can see to the left and right sharply on either side, there are no sides to the face. Now this gets to the position that um, there has to be an image formation that comes straight out at you. There's no ears and no cheeks. And if you look to the left, you can see blood that appears to be in the hair. Well, the hair doesn't bleed. So this is an example of the shroud at one point tightly wrapped around the cheeks of the man in the shroud with the blood in it. And then at another point in the formation of the image, the shroud has to unwrap and become flat. So the blood that was there before the image has to separate out and look like it's not part of the face, and then the image comes over it. So the blood precedes the image. 
Next slide. Now, if the shroud did not unwrap and become flat, the image of Christ would have been this wide, you know, unusual, uh, oversized image on the top versus a precise, pristine, digitalized picture on the bottom right. Next slide. So the shroud, if we work back, just, in, for, just let me digress a minute. In science, when you have a problem, you have the fact in front of you, there's an object. You have to explain the object. So we know the shroud is in front of us. We know it has an image. So with our knowledge of photography and physics, we know, given the image, what had to happen. So next slide, we go back to where we were. So what had to happen for us to, you know, the one before that, there you go. What had to happen is the tightly uh, wound shroud against the body had to some unexplained reason spread out and at the moment of spreading out there had to be the creation of the image. Next slide. Now, to explain what happened at the moment of resurrection it's almost chilling to think of the next series of statements that had to happen. This, if you look closely, you can see uh, the buttocks of the backside of, of the man in the shroud, and you can see his legs with the knees bent forward. So he's in the position of rigor mortis. But there is absolutely no evidence of pressure on the muscles. The body had to weigh 170 pounds. But at this point, there's no indentation on the muscle tissue at all. So at this point, the man in the shroud was weightless. Next wow. slide. That's amazing. And the only theory that comes up to make this accurate, working backwards from the picture we're given, is this picture. This picture shows a, a truly uh, risen Christ who is floating. He is actually risen. The shroud is unwrapped. It's flat. Now it becomes a photographic plate. The, there is no gravity at all, and the body is now, all the matter is going to turn into energy, dematerialize. The clots are going to detach from the tissue because the body is disappearing. Therefore, the clots are remaining on the shroud with no movement in the clots. Next slide. So what you have is a breakdown of the atoms of the man in the shroud, energy being released. Now, that we're not exactly sure what kind of energy, but we're getting closer. Right now, the theory is the electron part of it for somehow God controlled the release of the energy, atoms, protons, neutrons, uh, and the electrons, and only the electrons seem to be the, the source of energy. They wouldn't burn it immediately. And you can see now the, the body, 360 degrees, is totally de dematerializing. Next slide. And then it disappears and the shroud collapses. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, now, this is just a, a graphic illustration uh, of an electronic chamber. So in the chamber we have the circle representing the body of Christ and the two horizontal uh, boards uh, above it and below it representing the shroud. So in the dematerialization of the body, the electrons, as you can see, are flying off 360 degrees in all direction. So if there is no shroud at the left and the right side, there's no image. Hmm. Okay, so since the shroud, the picture we're given is a clear, distinct frontal picture the back uh, of the man of the shroud and the front of the man of the shroud is totally clear because all the radiation went perpendicular in a straight line and hit that um, photographic plate, so to speak. Next slide. And this is what we have. As I mentioned before, no sides. The radiation is perpendicular. There is no uh, image underneath the blood. And the radiation is so perfectly controlled that it, it ages and breaks the carbon-carbon bonds of the carbohydrate molecules of the linen and breaking those bonds ages it, makes it look a little bit yellow and a little darker yellow, giving us the image, but does not burn the cloth. Hmm. Next slide. And this is where we are, 2012 science. There's no evidence this is a fake. 21st century techniques cannot reproduce it. I, I'm speechless because I, I, I you know, I, I need you to do all this over <laughs> after the program is completed today because I, I am almost still hung up on the He is risen, you know, and what that means. Literally. And yes, and what that means. He is risen. Um, the, the various theological implications of that in light of this scientific 
uh, discovery, in a sense, or theory, is totally amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm flabbergasted, and, and frankly, I prepared for this interview, so it's not the first time I'm seeing these images, but your explanation of it drives the point home. That, Father, what do you say about this? Well, you know, again, the details are just mind-boggling, you know, and the ways in which every piece of this wants to kind of flood us with possibilities, possibilities we never entertained. Now, in terms of our faith, we don't need to know that, to be honest. No. Mm -hmm. Those things don't add to our faith, but they certainly give us impetus to take our faith, the gift of faith. Remember, faith is not something I bring about. No. It is a gift that it's is true. given. But that that can propel me to respond, respond to the man of the shroud. Well, you know, it reminds me of, um, of a conversation we had last evening because we were all out to dinner and Father Mitch was with us as well. And he, he was talking about, we were talking about some aspect of scripture. And, um, and he went back and shared with us what that word meant in the, in the Greek. Uh, I think it was in the Greek or it could have been in the Aramaic, I forget. But the, but the fact of the matter is, it didn't change my faith. I believed mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. But what it did mm -hmm. was to help me have a, a, a deeper understanding mm -hmm. of that which I believed. And so I liken that example mm -hmm. to precisely what, what this does. It, it enhances the belief and it permits us to, in some way, catch a new light um, reflecting off of a facet yeah. of the treasury that is ours. We've got to go to a break, and I'm glad because I have to calm down. <laughs> so thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Father. Friends, we're going to be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Dr. Wayne Phillips, and Father Edmund Sylvia, who is our theological advisor and our chaplain for all of our outreaches through Living His Life Abundantly, including, of course, Women of Grace. It's wonderful to be with you, and I hope that you are as, um, what shall I say, um, mm, experiencing holy zeal about what we're hearing today and you know just allowing the Lord to begin to work in you to appreciate the great mysteries of our faith that's one of the things that we live to do through Women of Grace and our outreaches through Women of Grace so I do want to invite you to get out there to our website www.womenofgrace.com all kinds of good resources there for you ladies I want to encourage you to become members of Grace Place where you can meet all uh, many 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 sisters in the faith from around the world really and we want to invite you all also to become a Women of Grace WOG exclusive member so that many other resources are available to you just by clicking a button and we really really enjoy that. I also have a list of books that I recommend this year and one of those books uh, is also excellent for you. It's called Padre Pio's Spiritual Direction for Everyday Life. I have found this to be most useful in my own spiritual walk and in my interior life. It's almost as if Padre Pio is sitting there and giving you guidance and I can't tell you the numbers of times it is matched up perfectly with exactly what I've needed to hear. So I want to recommend the book to you and you can get out there on the website and get it or you can call us at 800-558-5452. Wayne, Father, uh, I, I think I'm a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> Um, this is exciting things to, to consider. And as you said, Father, uh, when we look at what science is showing to us, it doesn't change our belief or our faith, no. but it can certainly enhance our appreciation of it. And maybe even a depth of understanding with regard to it. Go well, ahead. We all know that facts are important. Mm -hmm. But facts <laughs> and conclusions are two different things. Right. You need certainly to gather the facts in order to come to a good conclusion. Mm -hmm. But we also know that conclusions and our ability to get our arms around that conclusion, appreciate it to the depths, et cetera, changes as our knowledge increases. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing process. Put that with mystery, which like I said, is God's action. It's his theophany, it's his presence, it's his power, et cetera. Uh, that will never be so easily reduced, nor will we, no matter how smart we might be, ever get our arms around it no. as if it right. were smaller than us yeah. and our ability to, to comprehend. So that keeps us in a tension that is very important because otherwise it's so easy for us to get stuck in the material world and trying to figure out how 
everything came about, when in fact, of course, while it, there's truth there, we also have this bigger mystery. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we often make a distinction, don't we, um, when we consider the, the moment of resurrection uh, versus, versus, if you will, um, Our Lady's awakening from her time of dormition. I'm, I'm using that mm -hmm. as an example. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about Jesus resurrecting from the dead, that's something that's under his own power, as opposed to our Blessed Lady, for example, when however that transpired, it was an action that, that was came outside of her and was basically performed you know, upon right. her in right. a certain right. sense, right? Jesus ascends into heaven by his own power. Our Blessed Lady is taken up by the angels as we look mm -hmm. at, the, uh, mm -hmm. at the assumption. And this is yet another aspect of what you've been sharing with us, Wayne, in that when we consider that slide that showed the probability of weightlessness and why that, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, makes sense in light of what the shroud shows us. This was an action that was not coming from outside of Jesus being affected upon him. Absolutely. This was something that was coming from within him and affecting the mm -hmm. change on the outside. Talk mm -hmm. with us a bit about that. Well, that is definitely part of the miracle. And uh, even though I think we maybe hit on how the image was created, we don't know the energy source that created what I just said, all the things we just put, looked at detail that are shown on the shroud. Now, I don't know if we're ever going to know where the energy source came from. It obviously came from God, but to understand it is maybe beyond our comprehension. Right. But um, I agree with what Father said about the conclusions. The conclusions uh, that I like to think, I like to take a little more of a bold step from a lot of the shroud researchers who say, this is uh, really authentic, but they can't go as far as to say it is Jesus Christ. Well, I, in all sincerity, I disagree with that. And I can say it is Jesus Christ, and I'm not gonna, it's gonna, what I have to say now is almost like a joke, but I don't mean it as a joke. Because scientifically, and I think I discussed this mm -hmm. with Father Ed too, there are only three possibilities that what happened, because the image exists, it's on the shroud. So the three possibilities are, one, the one that I believe, it is Jesus Christ. Number two, you have to think of it as a regular human being who God dematerialized on the spot. And the third one, and laugh as much as you, mu as you may, a creature from outer space in the, pos in the f physical being of a human that was beamed up to his spaceship. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a body in there, it didn't dematerialize, so go ahead and choose which three. I know which one I like out of the best three. <laughs> I choose A. <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. Beam me up, Scotty. Well, you know, I, I have to admit that Star Trek entered my mind when we right. talked about dematerialization, you right. know. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, you know, our God is the God of, of, of the universe. He's, he, and Jesus is the Word made flesh. Everything came into being, spoken through the Word, who is the second person of the Blessed Trinity mm -hmm. in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And so how all of this works doesn't really even matter because I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that we cannot grasp it with our finite minds. And when we get to heaven, we won't care because we'll be in the mm -hmm. presence of the one. And as a result of that, you know, all of our answers through infused knowledge, you know, the, all of those questions will be answered anyway. But, but the fact of the matter is for those of us, you know, who still struggle to try to understand the majesty of God with the limited capacities that we have, I think that it's thrilling sure is. to it is, explore it is. the power, and I mean like when the psalmist talks about the power and the majesty of God, here we have it, you know? Well, you know, as you have been recommending the uh, video there, or I should say DVD on the resurrection, Right. you know, there are many other theories that have been put forward over the years mm -hmm. about the resurrection, you know, everything from the swoon theory to... Uh, you know, the body was taken, whatever, all those kinds of things. And those will always be part of our coming to uh, understand why the resurrection is of such pivotal importance. Right. I mean, it is the cherry on the top. It is so important. Um, but as uh, people would want us to kind of work through those theories and see why what the church has taught over these last millennia is is so much more reasonable, more to the point, uh, it all still begs us to believe. 
Yeah. Is it is it Paul, Father, that says in Scripture, is this Scripture at all? I think it is. You know, Paul says, you know, that that if, if Jesus died and he did not raise from the dead, we are the most foolish of men. Is that most right? pitiable. Pitiable of men. So, yeah, in I mean, our, our, our faith, if For you will. For we are still in our sins. That's true. Aha. Uh -huh. We haven't been saved at all. We haven't been saved at all. Yes. So, our faith, in a sense, pivots, if you will, on the passion, death, resurrection of our Lord mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, the Paschal mystery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and uh, certainly you have helped us to mm -hmm. uh, appreciate that great reality uh, all the more deeply. I'm just a messenger. Ah, uh, well, I, I, like, <laughs> I like this kind of message, Wayne, <laughs> so keep on speaking it. And we want to let you know that Dr. Wayne Phillips is available to speak it in your parish. And we've been jogging between uh, identifying him as a member of the Shroud Science Group and also giving you his email address. So if you would like for him to come to your parish, all you have to do is email him at the address that's being shown there. I think it's Bridget and Wayne at yahoo.com and he'll be happy to respond. I think your wife is going to be a very busy lady keeping up with these emails. Uh, we want Hello everyone and welcome to Women of Grace. I'm Johnette Benkovic. Do you recall what sacred scripture tells us in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 6 and 7? They tell us about when Peter and John enter the tomb of Jesus. This is what those passages say. When Simon Peter arrived after him, meaning John, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. What is this cloth that had covered the head of Jesus? Where is it? And does it corroborate the findings of the shroud? These are the questions our guest will answer for us today as we discuss dynamic duo, the Sudarium and the shroud. <laughs> Conduct just about any kind of an investigation and nothing is more welcome than what is often called corroborating evidence. What might be the best corroborating evidence to prove the shroud's authenticity? Another relic that is congruent with what the shroud's data reveals. And my friends, that is exactly what we have in the cloth or napkin that covered the face of Jesus. That very piece of fabric mentioned in John 20, verse 7. Here to tell us about the Sudarium and what it tells us about the shroud is our guest, Dr. Wayne Phillips, an allergist who is a member of the esteemed Shroud Science Group. On set with us as well is our own father, Edmund Sylvia a Holy Cross priest and theological advisor and chaplain to Women of Grace. Father Ed, Wayne, welcome back today. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, you know, it's hard for me to believe that, that we have done, uh, you know, five programs on this wonderful, wonderful topic of the shroud. And in some ways, this topic that we're going to discuss today, the shroud and the sudarium, is just as exhilarating as everything else that we have discussed through the course of the week. I call them the dynamic duo. Mm. And in fact, they really are the dynamic duo, aren't they, Wayne? Yes, I would say that this is another proof of authenticity. The sudarium uh, gives us more information about the shroud being authentic. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting, too, because we began our discussion uh, with the first program, and we referenced a passage in Mark that talked about the cloth that covered Jesus' body and mm -hmm. that Joseph of Arimathea had provided it, right? And here we are again going back to sacred scripture and seeing that this cloth that covered the face of Jesus was not part of the shroud, it was separate no. from it. And uh, John and Peter saw that cloth and it's specifically mentioned in John's Gospel. Another little thing I like about that particular passage, totally beside the point for our program today, but I want to mention, notice that John arrives at the tomb first, but he waits for Peter to enter. Mm -hmm. And that's important because already it begins to show the primacy of Peter, mm -hmm. even in the lives of the apostles so shortly after mm -hmm. the death of Jesus. So that was already a fact that was well known. But back to the topic at hand, uh, this cloth has been quite a bit of a mystery as well, hasn't it? This cloth is uh, particularly important because every one of us can go see it three times a year. Mm -hmm. It is on exposition to the public constantly. And when I saw it in 2004, I didn't know there was going to be a 2010 exposition, didn't know if I'd be around for the next one 25 years later. So I went to see the Sudarium, and it is amazing because as you read about it and uh, begin to see the details of it, it helps you absolutely believe the authenticity of the shroud, and you can see it three times a year. Wow. And that, again, I think speaks to um, the generous gratuity of God. I mm -hmm. mean, it's like he doesn't want us to just get this. 
You know, he's saying, yeah. I really want you to get this. <laughs> and so here's it. another relic. You know, like if this doesn't do it for you, let me give you something yeah. else. And we talked about that father as being corroborating evidence. In other words, sure. you know, the two support each other in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the uh, blessing of being able to witness the shroud, not only in, excuse me, not the shroud, I, although I did see that back in 1998. But in 2001, I was there for the last of the yearly uh, bringing forth of the Sudarium. But not only were we there for that, and I was celebrating as it was brought out, et cetera, mm -hmm. gathered there in the altar in Oviedo, Spain, which is where the Sudarium is. But we as a tour group had uh, left right after 9-11, literally, first planes out of New York City, uh, to make our way to Spain for this important event. And the people who were head of this tour were very much interested in finding a fitting reliquary for the Sudarium. Because as Wayne says, it's shown three times a year, but it's not protected, mm -hmm. it's not covered, just a lot of issues there. But we were given, because of, I think, their dedication to trying to forward that work, we were given a privileged moment in the treasure vault downstairs mm. in the cathedral to see it up close and personal. I was closer to it than I am to Wayne right now. Wow. wow. That's close. So that was very, <laughs> very special. Yes, um, indeed. So, but you know, what led to that tour actually was our good friend of ours, Mary Jo Anderson, had mm -hmm. done research on the Sudarium. So that was the very first time it was ever brought into my purview, my understanding. So yeah. when I was offered this opportunity, I jumped at the chance. Oh, so. I can't blame you for jumping at the chance, and I quite well remember when you went. <laughs> I was a little concerned about that, but to the grace of God, you know, it all went well, and you had this privileged moment, yes. and so clearly ordained by the Lord. And I want to thank you at the beginning of the program here, Wayne, uh, for the excellent research that you have done in putting together all of the slides that we've had the privilege of showing all of you this week. And it's been wonderful for me to have uh, this opportunity to get a deeper understanding and appreciation of the Shroud. So thank you so much for you're being our welcome. guest. Thank you for what you're doing for the church and for the people of God in doing these presentations. And you will see uh, Wayne's email address up there. It's wayneshroud at yahoo.com. You can contact contact him and he'll come to your church and he will do this uh, a beautiful presentation for all of your parishioners so we encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity let's get to the to the Sudarian it too has an interesting history mm -hmm. it is a journeyed piece of fabric as is the shroud as well isn't it extremely interesting history can we have the first slide we can show you what we're talking about um, well we talked about this already we can go, we can passage. skip this yes John Ed went over that so what is a sudarium? Next slide. There we go. The sudarium is an inexpensive linen cloth. It's about three feet long, two feet wide, and there is no image on it. The reason there's no image on it is that it was uh, thought to have covered the head of Jesus after he died while he was on the cross. So we're going to mm -hmm. show you in uh, subsequent slides the positioning of it because what is on this is, uh, go back, Go back to the first one. The first one of the, yes, of the sudarium itself. On the left and on the right are two different flows of a mixture of fluid, blood and fluid, that are called pulmonary edema fluid. So when, uh, when Jesus went into shock, uh, the heart stops, the lungs are filled with fluid, he dies, he it does an expiration of air, and the fluid that's bubbling in the lungs comes through the nose. So this was put on his head, and, and the stains on the left represent the position of his head on the cross in a vertical position, and then he was taken down from the cross, and a little bit upsetting to understand, laid on his face on the ground, and the shroud was repositioned on his head, making another stain of blood and water, pulmonary fluid on the right. So we can go, so, so the, the interesting part then, we can go to the next slide, is how this all has been traced. Because the authenticity of this is not in question. This is documented mm. to exist in Oviedo, Spain, since the year 700. My goodness. And this cloth has the same blood type as Christ's blood on the shroud, AB, same blood type, same pollen distribution. No, excuse me, doesn't have Constantinople doesn't have Constantinople pollen, 
and um, the positioning when when they do digital overlay one of the scientists took digital pictures of the stains of the sidereum and the and the uh, the face of uh, Jesus on the shroud and by digital overlay and Polaroid's light we'll be able to say that they fit each other on top perfectly can we go to the next slide so this is, as Father Ed was talking about, this is a San Salvador Cathedral in Viedo, Spain, and this is a Camara Santa, which was the area where they keep the sidereum. And uh, it isn't really too secure, and it's quite upsetting, and I, we got to figure out how to contribute to that <laughs> cause because it, it scared me. Actually, when I saw the sidereum live, it was uh, 20 feet away without glass covering it, and a little squirt gun, squirt gun with ink would have certainly destroyed it. So the next slide. So here it is, being brought out in its presentation. It's exhibited every September 14th, every September 21st, and Easter. I recommend the 21st, not Easter, if you really want to get close to it. But as you can see, it's, it's an ordinary cloth, not overwhelming in size, with two stains on it. Next slide. Now, in 1997, the Spanish scientist, Edices, E-D-I-C-E-S, actually got together and, and everything I mentioned about the overlay of the digital image, the blood typing, uh, the, the measure of uh, six to one blood versus clear serous fluid, making it pulmonary edema, and the pollen was all investigated by the Spanish scientist and published. Next slide. So here we have, as you look at the center top, the position of uh, Jesus on the, on the cross, uh, covered, his face is now covered in this cloth, and you can see the yellowy material, that would be the, uh, exam the example of the fluid coming on to the first position of the shroud. Mm -hmm. The lower position is when he was lying on his face on the ground, very indignant position, and I was very upset when I found out his face was on the ground, but that's what they did. And the flow, of, you can see at his uh, forehead, if you look at his forehead, it's tilted so that the tip of the head is down. So gravity is now taking the pulmonary fluid from right to left. Mm -hmm. And the original stain that you can see in the picture above from the nose to the chin still is there. Next slide. So the position of the upper, uh, when he was on the cross, it looked like this, the way it was banded. And then the second position is on the right and third position on the ground uh, when he was flat. Next slide. Now, on the right, is the digital picture of the sidereum working its way over to the digital picture of the shroud. Next slide. And as you can see, it's going to match up. Next slide. There you go. So again, the yellow material on the front is the, is the position of the fluid that came when he was lying flat on the ground, gravity pulling it forward, and the part around his mouth and to the left cheek was the fluid exuding when he was on the cross upright. Mm -hmm. So you can see the blue or the gray blue is the shroud and the sudarium is in yellow. So the fluid and the positioning of this says that there is an exact congruence in any type of criminal case. You can win your case if you have 46 points of congruence between a picture or something in, a, in an item that matches another uh, item in a, in a criminal case. This has over 72 positions of congruence. My goodness. Next slide. And there they are side by side. The Shroud of Turin on the left and the, the, the reddish image of the Shroud of Turin with the sidereum overlay. Next slide. And there you have it. For the Downing Thomases, this is our summary. Hmm. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing here, obviously, is that it, the, the sudarium is not the relic in question, but it perfectly corroborates the shroud. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to say that the shroud is not the burial cloth of Jesus, just based on what you're sharing with us. And I didn't know that you need to have, is it 46 points of congruence, congruence to, yes. to, to be, um, uh, you know, the, the corroborating win. evidence necessary to win an investigation. Yes, to win your case. And we've got over how many? A hundred and? 72 positions of congruence on here. There you go. So yeah. a, a, an extreme amount, an extreme number. Now, when we, when we view the sidereum, it's brought out three times a year. Uh, how, is it, how is it responded to by the people who come? Uh, the people are the local community. I, I was mm -hmm. uh, amazed that there weren't that many travelers from other parts of Europe or America. Um, it's like it's, it's not known. Yeah. Well, I hope that it gets better known, and I hope that 
lots of you go there and who knows maybe we'll all go together that would be a marvelous opportunity uh, to behold the sudarian because it's so available to us as opposed mm -hmm. to the shroud we're going to go to our break when we come back more with our guest dr wayne phillips and he's got some more enlightening areas to share with us regarding some of the controversies that have cropped up uh, with the shroud father edwin sylvia with us too we'll be right back stay with us Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Dr. Wayne Phillips, Father Ed Sylvia, our theological advisor and chaplain on Sinus Two for this uh, wonderful grouping of programs. It's just been a great series on the sci on science and the shroud. We want to make it available to you as we do all of the great resources that we have at Women of Grace. You can do that by simply going out to our website, www.womenofgrace.com. While you're there, sign up for Grace Place Ladies and meet all mm, kinds of ladies from all around the world who are part of this great growing movement of Women of Grace. In addition to that, we want to encourage you to become a member of WOG Exclusive so that the valuable resources resources that we've got available for you can be yours anytime it fits into your scheduling. So go check it out. I like to mention to you every once in a while that we do have a recommended reading book list every year. And these are books that I collect that have really me helped me in my own spiritual life and continue to be great resources for me to dip back into. One that's been particularly good for me is a new one, basically new, uh, Padre Pio's Spiritual Direction for Every Day. It's like this great saint of God is sitting there talking with you directly, and so I highly recommend it to you. It's available at www.womenofgrace.com or call us at 800-558-5452. Well, you know, we went to the break and we were talking about the way in which we, uh, the, the, the Sudarium, which is the face class of Jesus, corroborates the Shroud of Turin. And we mentioned quickly in passing that, you know, this had a, a re relatively, uh, circuitous route of getting from Jerusalem to Oviedo, Spain, but it was never lost track of. We right. can go back historically and say where it was yeah. every single mm -hmm. moment, and that's why we say that this is authentic, that it's not questioned, there's no proof that needs to be because we have historical record that tells us where it was. Yeah, it's documented in writings, and essentially was, as Father was pointing out, it was escaping from the advancing Muslims. Mm -hmm. So uh, as it moved across Africa, it was there for a while, then the Muslims encroached, and it moved to another Egypt location, then it moved across the Mediterranean, then it moved to Toledo, Spain, and then it moved finally to Oviedo, and the Pyrenees Mountains where nobody could get at it. Mm -hmm. so, it so it did have a totally different route than the... Uh, Shroud of Turin. Did. Yes, and there's an interesting story, Father, about when the Sudarium ends up in Oviedo, Spain, mm -hmm. and the way in which it was regarded, the, the, the cask, if you will, that it came in, the treasure chest that it came in. Yes, I mean, historically, we have evidence that uh, the Queen of Spain at the time, as well as El Cid, who was a very famous uh, historic figure in Spain, both fasted for 30 days before this treasure chest was opened in which the Sudarium was. That's how seriously they took, you know, the privilege of having uh, such a holy object brought yeah. to them. Uh, it's hard to imagine that at the time they received it, they realized that this would become basically its home, you know, and that uh, all of these, uh, what, hundreds of years later, yes. centuries later, it still resides still there. there. Well, that part of Spain is very proud to say that they were never conquered. Mm -hmm. And actually, the reconquest of Spain, which of course came to its conclusion in 1492, all know the story of Isabel and Ferdinand, you know, having pushed the Moors out, you have this union of Aragon and uh, mm -hmm. Castile. Mm -hmm. Well, Wayne, I know that there are still other controversies, however, that uh, rage about the Shroud, and I thought maybe we would take the last part of our program today to dispel them. Right now? Yeah, sure, okay. let's do it. Well, typically when I make a presentation, uh, the hopeful people in the audience always would like to know, the carbon dating was done wrong, can we do it again? What can we do to do it again? To do that and to understand it, it, it has to be explained as to the predicament we're in. Because as the Turin authorities kind of went against the protocols that international scientists had developed in order to do the original carbon dating, they decided again in 2002 to go against the international consensus on 
restoring, or the better word is preserving the trail, but the word they use was restoring. So the definition of restoring, however, would be to eliminate the image, eliminate the blood, and make it a perfectly clean linen cloth. Oh dear. So no. they almost did that. Mm. So in 2002, they cut out all the burn holes, all the carbon, thinking that the carbon was going to deteriorate the shroud. But the scientists of the world know that carbon is inert and cannot deteriorate anything. So that was a mistake. Then they vacuumed the entire shroud. So all the evidence, all the dust, mm. all the microbes, all the pollen, all vacuumed, supposedly into safe little vials marked into squares. So the shroud now is very clean. And then they took off the back that was put by the poor nuns of uh, the 16th century and put on a totally clean backing cloth that one of them owned with unknown chemicals in the cloth. Oh, so right no. now we all have to pray a little bit that that hasn't set up the story to destroy the shroud. But that is a fact. We have to live with it. Now, as to the carbon dating, we have, not me, but this, the real shroud scientists have requested some of that carbon that was cut out of those burn sites. Because when you take a piece of linen or mm -hmm. anything and you do carbon dating, you have to burn it into pure carbon. So the first step's done. So all they have to do is give some vials of carbon to the same carbon-14 labs. And since it's not in one section where there was a reweaving, mm -hmm. it's in four different locations, it would be way more accurate. So someday, hopefully, that will happen. Now, the good news is, there's good news in that Yay, tragedy. Yeah, I'm hoping so, because that's The good that's news sad. in that tragedy is, now I'm guessing, because the archbishop that was in power at the time those two major flaws happened, and his advisor scientists are no longer there. As of October 2010, there is a brand new archbishop, very young person, that uh, has as his sidekick priest a physicist. Oh, how ha that's a happy so circumstance. So for 20 years, this duo, different dynamic duo, has been in a scientific pursuit of wherever they were, but now they're in charge of the Shroud of Turin. So as of October 2010, we have the hope, and the scientists of the Shroud, some of the Americans are going to try to get together with the, art, the new archbishop and plan, hopefully getting some of that carbon and setting up future experiments with people who are in the know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be hopeful. When, when do you expect that we would have any news on that? Well, Because I, I get the email of the Shroud Science Group, um, Joe Marino has said that they are going to be doing that in September. Uh, Barry Schwartz will be trying to talk to the Archbishop and see if they can set up some kind of agreement on future uh, research. But, ah, okay. So, so that we would have be our hopes up. September of 2012, because yes. that's the year that we're yes. taping this. Um, well, that means that we'll have to have you come back and share with us <laughs> what happens with regard to all Hopefully of that, it if happens. indeed that does happen. Uh, I, I, that, that's uh, carrying good housekeeping to a level that ought never to yeah. occur, you know, uh, and, and that's very sad. I think that sometimes all kinds of, of decisions are made without thinking forward mm -hmm. as to what it is that we're Quite actually upsetting. about. Are there any other situations that have developed with the shroud that we ought to know about? Uh, yes. Uh, this Christmas, uh, an Italian research team uh, developed ultraviolet uh, f f uh, photo energy. And as you're probably aware of it, it was released in Christmas as it created an image similar to the image on the shroud, had a similar effect on just the very uh, top surface fibers. However, um, not as good as the idea that we presented, which was uh, corona discharge, um, but it was a beginning. And of course, the press took it further than they should have. And now it's really kind of ironic because, because they were saying that this proved the shroud was real. But here we are in an unusual position of having to take a scientific study and saying, well, it doesn't prove the shroud is real because it doesn't quite match. Mm -hmm. So now we have the reverse. So, it's no matter whether the press is for it or against it, it's always causing confusion. So I, I thought that well, was pretty interesting. It is pretty interesting, but and it goes back really to, to what you were saying, mm -hmm. Father, in an earlier program, where you talked about the fact that you know this 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 quest for knowledge uh, that can be explained versus faith has always got to be held. In, in a healthy tension. That's right. and, I, and I really want for you to share with us about that, not just in reference to the shroud, because I think that we get it, 
but just in reference to everything in our daily lives. I mean, let's just draw this out to uh, the way in which we conduct ourselves. We can never know 100%, can we? But we can certainly be about the business of doing everything we can to be within the will of God. Absolutely. You know, again, the challenge of living in the material world and yet recognizing that, wait a minute, our destiny is far beyond this. And it's not just what I can see, feel, touch, etc that matters in life. All of this is what draws us into those deeper uh, theological questions, those questions of faith that are of ultimate importance because they have to do with everlasting life. Just as we said earlier, the resurrection is the definitive moment that in fact authenticates everything Jesus said about who he was, why he had come, etc. That uh, again, if we allow our faith to grow and we have to cooperate, we're not the source, but what is required is cooperation. It gives light so that everything else in our lives can be properly seen. Mm -hmm. well, I want to thank you, Father, for those beautiful closing words. And I want to thank you, Wayne, for being with us and sharing with us. And I know that I'll never read the Passion accounts quite the same again. Mm -hmm. This certainly does speak to the humanity of our Lord. And uh, we need to discover that humanity that we might come to understand ourselves better. Well, friends, we do thank you for being with us. We don't take you for granted. It's always a pleasure to know that you're watching our program. We would ask for you to continue to pray for us that we might continue to be of service to you. And we do encourage you to get out there at www.womenofgrace.com. All of the programs from this week available for you, as are all of the resources that we mentioned, including Did Jesus Really Rise from the Dead? A great DVD presentation and the book that I've recommended for you on Padre Pio giving us spiritual direction. And so, my dear friends in Christ, until we're together again, may the abundant life of Jesus Christ be yours, and may God richly bless you. Bye-bye now.